The sixth sermon. This may be for caution to the godly to prevent the mistakes of those that have this importunity and think they have it not. Here also they have some seeming reasons. I shall name them and withal answer them. Their first reason is this. Others pray better than I, saith the godly man. Others perform duties with more enlargedness. Now, this reasoning is not good. First, it may be those that thou apprehendest to pray better than thou are of longer standing and larger experience in the ways of God than thou art. God does not expect any more from a man, but according to that measure of grace that he gives the man, and according to his growth and standing in grace. Paul was not at all discouraged because Epinetus was the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ, Romans 16.5, nor at Andronicus and Junia that were of note among the apostles and in Christ before him, verse 7. And if Paul was not discouraged, why shouldest thou be discouraged to see other Christians outstrip thee? It may be they are of longer standing than thou. Second, it may be thou dost judge and compare thyself with others at a great disadvantage. As first, it may be thou dost compare thyself and and thy praying in secret with the praying of others in public. Now, this is very disadvantageous, for in public men have not only inward but also outward encouragements, and so thorough the corruption that is in all our hearts, they are more drawn forth at that time than in secret. And second, it may be thou dost compare their expression with thine affection. It may be there is more in thine affections than all the multitude of their expressions. Thou art not to compare thy affections with the multitude of other men's words. Third, it may be thou dost compare thyself with others when they are at the best and highest and thou at the worst and lowest. There's a great difference betwixt a man and himself at several times. Now you judge unequally if you compare yourself in that manner. Third, in some cases this may be no discouragement to thee, as first, if thou art weaker in natural gifts, though good affections flow from grace, yet good expressions proceed from the goodness of natural abilities. Second, in case thou art not of as long standing in religion. Third, if thou hast lesser time and opportunities for prayer by reason of necessary cares and encumbering employments. When Jonah was entered into the ship, there was a great storm, and so much that the ship was ready to sink. Now, all the mariners were at prayer. Every man cried to his God, but Jonah was fast asleep. Now, one would have thought that Jonah had been a most stupid man. But the reason was the greatness of his journey a little before, which caused him to be so heavy to sleep. It may be a man that hath less grace than thou may pray better than thou, because he is not troubled with these worldly encumbrances that thou art necessarily engaged in. For God doth not distribute gifts and graces to all alike. God hath not appointed that all men should grow in grace alike. To this purpose I may apply Nehemiah 11.17. Mataniah, the son of Micah, the son of Zabdi, the son of Asaph, was the principal to begin the thanksgiving in prayer. And back Bacchiah, the second among his brethren, and Abda, the son of Shammuz, the third. God doth not intend that all should be alike in grace or gifts. God hath his first, second, and third. One may fall short of another, and yet... All have the truth of grace. Yea, all have some growth in grace. Another may pray better, and yet thou pray well. Another may pray more affectionately, and yet thou pray as acceptably in the sight of God. So much for answer to the first reason. Second, many a poor soul may say, I can remember since I could pray better and more largely. Now, if I could pray better formerly than now, I am now grown remiss and want this holy importunity. But this is no sound reason. For first, it may be thou hadst formerly more affection, but less judgment, less experience, less spiritualness in thy prayers. It may be now thou art more found in knowledge, thou makest a more inward progress in holiness. Thou canst now make a more inward prayer to God. Thou hast now more inward communion with God. 
If this be so, thou hast no cause to be discouraged. God loves a judicious prayer as well as a large and affectionate prayer. You see what you want one way, you make up another way. A young carpenter gives more blows and makes more chips, but an old and experienced workman doth the most and best work. A young musician can play more quickly and nimbly upon an instrument, but an old musician hath more skill. The second, it may be when thou hast more affections in prayer, thou hast more sin in prayer, more pride in thy gifts, more dependence upon thy duties, more censoriousness of others, and many other corruptions that did accompany thy prayers and thy affectionateness in them. Now, though thou hast less affections, yet those other corruptions are in great part eaten out. And third, it may be thou hast not now so many helps and opportunities to keep up thine heart, to stir up thine affections in prayer as thou hadst formerly. It may be thou didst formerly live under the teachings of an able, godly minister. Now thou hast lost that opportunity. And so there are several other helps that peradventure are now taken away from thee. Fourth, though it is true, thou art abated, and thou didst pray better formerly than now. Yet ought not this to be a matter of discouragement to thee? First, if it doth not proceed from a voluntary carelessness. Second, if it be not accompanied with hardness and insensibleness. Third, if it be not continued with laziness and contentedness. And so much for answer to the second reason. Third reason, another ground of doubting to the people of God is this. They complain that they have not those enlarged expressions in prayer which God's people used to have. For answer, consider these things. First, this hath many times been the case of God's own people that they have wanted expressions. They could not find a vent for their affections. Thus it was with Hannah. She spake in her heart. She was not able to express herself. So it was with holy David, Psalm 77, 4, I am so troubled that I cannot speak. And yet, in the first verse of the psalm, he tells us he cried unto the Lord with his voice. Here was a heart full of prayer, though he wanted utter utterance. And second, it is better to have affections without expressions than expressions without affections. God looks more to the desires of the heart than to the words of the mouth. It may be... What thou wantest of expression is made up in affection. Third, it may be what is wanting in words is made up in life. As thou art defective in expression, so thou makest a recompense in conversation. And that is the best expression that can be. It is much better to live a prayer than to express a prayer. It is good to pray for grace, but it is better to live a life of grace. It is good to pray against sin, but it is better to live against sin. And so much for answer to the third doubt. A fourth ground of doubting is this. Many a disconsolate Christian is apt to say, I am troubled with wandering thoughts, with deadness and dullness of heart in prayer. I confess thy case is sad and to be lamented for. And it is just matter of humiliation, yet even here is a matter of comfort. First, if thou do it, dost what thou canst to free thyself from wanderings before thou comest to pray. Second, if thou dost what thou canst to resist these wanderings when you are come before God in prayer. Third, if you be sensible of these wanderings afterward. If you can say you do these three things, your wanderings shall never be laid to your charge. And thus I have done with both these uses of caution. And so I have done with the principal doctrine, which was this, that in holy importunity and earnestness of spirit is a condition required in the prayers of God's people if they expect returns thereunto. There is another considerable doctrine yet behind, taken from the amplification of the concession. He asked but three loaves. But because of his importunity, he gave him as many as he needed. The observation thence is this, that when the heart is importunate in begging mercy, God usually gives us more than we pray for. 
in the handling of this doctrine, I shall first prove it by scripture instances, and second, I shall lay down the reasons of it, and third, I shall answer some objections and cases of conscience, and so I shall come to application. First, I shall prove it by scripture instances. You have the instance of Hannah in 1 Samuel 1. She begged a son, which with much importunity, being a woman of sorrowful spirit, for want of a son. Well, God returns her an answer. Sheminitis observes that Hannah asked a son and God gave her a prophet. She begged a son and God gave her a gracious son, a son greatly beloved of God. She asked a single mercy and God gave her a double blessing. Another instance you have in, in Abraham, Genesis 17, Abraham prayed, Oh, that Ishmael might live in thy sight. Well, what answer doth God return? That you have in verse 19, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. It was Abraham's desire that Ishmael might live. Now God not only grants that, but he grants him a better mercy. Another instance you have in the Canaanitish woman, Matthew 15, who did importunately beg of Christ the life and health of her daughter. Christ answered her thus, Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Now, if you ask, what is the reason why God deals thus with his people? I answer this first, this proceeds from the largeness and greatness of God's power and the riches and the freeness of his grace towards us. Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we are able to ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. A man may ask of another man, and it may be received, but then he must not ask again. But herein appears the power and ability, the goodness and bounty of God. If we ask of him once or twice, he is a God that is able to give, not according to our asking only, but above what we ask. And not only above what we can ask, but above what we can ask or think. The words are so full that they cannot be well expressed. God doth more than excessively. God hath not only a fullness of abundance, but of redundancy. Not only of plenty, but bounty. He is better than our prayers. Second, God will do this to relieve his people and to supply their spiritual wants. Among the wants of God's people, this is one that we do not know what we need nor what we should pray for as we ought. Romans 8:26. Therefore, God supplies our wants not only in what we ask, but in what we want, though we do not ask it nor pray for it. So much for the reasons I come now to answer some objections. But some may say, what privilege hath a godly man more than a wicked man? to have more to be given to him than he doth ask. Seeing we read of wicked men that they do prosper in the world and have more than their heart can wish. Psalm 73. I answer, first it is true, in temporal mercies, God may give wicked men more than the godly and more than their heart can wish. But God doth not give them spiritual mercies. As we may see in Balaam, God gave Balaam honors and riches but Balaam cried out, Oh, that I might die the death of the righteous. This God did not grant him. So many wicked men do say in a general way, Lord, pardon my sins. God doth not hear them. It may be a child of God may ask of God temporal mercies, and God will give him spiritual mercies. This is more than he did ask, and that much better than he gives to wicked men. Though God doth give unto wicked men more than their hearts can wish, yet God doth not give it as any return of prayer, but only as fruits of general and common providence, as they are his creatures whom he will preserve. Third, God may give wicked men more than their hearts can wish, and this is not in mercy, but in wrath. They may receive mercies, but not as mercies, not in mercy, and there are four demonstrations when God hears a man in wrath. First, when he asks anything of God that is sinful in its own nature, as the denial of it is an act of mercy, so the grant of it is a fruit of God's anger. 
God doth many times give those things in his anger which he denies when he is well pleased. God will not hear his own people according to their wills, but according to his own will. It is in this case, as it is with a father, when his child, for want of knowledge, asks a knife of him by which he may cut his fingers. The father will not give him the knife, except it be in wrath. So a man may ask mercies at the hand of God, and it may be God will give them in wrath to cut themselves with them. And second, if you ask those things of God, which though they are not sinful in their own nature, yet if thy asking of these lawful things be to an unlawful end, God will deny these in mercy. And when he gives them, it is in wrath as if thou desirest temporal mercies to abuse them to drunkenness or to live in any other sin and wickedness. If God give thee those mercies, tis as a testimony of his wrath to thee. So it was in the 78th Psalm, verse 18, they tempted God in their hearts and asked meat for their lust. There was the end of their desires. They desired a lawful thing for unlawful ends. But what followed? the wrath of God. For while the meat was in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them. Verse 30 and 31. Third, if you ask anything of God and he gives it in wrath, you may know by this, if it be an occasion of sin to thee, it is given thee in wrath. So it was with the Israelites even now mentioned, the meat that God gave them proved an occasion of sin. Verse 32, they sinned still and believed not his wondrous works. When the mercies you enjoy becomes fuel to your lusts, those mercies are accompanied with the curse and wrath of God. And this using of mercies will turn to the aggravation of wrath. The fourth, mercies are given thee in wrath when the enjoyment of them hinders thee from the receipt of greater mercies from God. Thus it is with the devils, Matthew 8, 31 and 32. They besought Christ that they might go into the herd of swine. Christ granted them that. He let them enter into swine that they might not enter into men. When the giving of temporal mercies hinders thee from the receipt of spiritual mercies, they are given in wrath. There are many men to whom God gives temporal mercies. They have riches in abundance, pleasure at will, everything they can desire. But these mercies take off their thoughts and affections from better things. By getting these, they lose Christ and grace immortality and eternal happiness. Now, in these cases, though God doth give mercies, yet they are given in wrath. And so, notwithstanding this objection, the privilege of God's people is much greater than the privilege of wicked men. But it may be further objected and inquired, if this be so, that mercies are given to wicked men in wrath and by a common providence, how may I know when mercies come to me as returns of prayer? Now, I shall answer that in these particulars. First, mercies are returns of prayer when the receiving of mercy is a means to quicken the heart to beg for other mercies at the hands of God. When the mercy shall make thee more to love prayer, more to use prayer, this you find proved by David's experience in Psalm 116 too. Because he hath heard my voice, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. You see here, because God had heard David's prayer and had given him the mercy he begged, he makes an argument and an engagement to himself to pray as long as he lived. So that to continue prayer is a means to get more mercy. And the leaving off of prayer, when you have a mercy, is a means to lose that which you have obtained at the hands of God. But as for the wicked, it is not so with them. Mercies received only from a common or general providence have no such efficacy as you may see in Job 21, 7 and 8. There Job tells you the wicked live, become old, yea, mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with them and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. And so he goes on describing that happy condition that wicked men were in and how God followed them with mercy after mercy. Well, what was the effect of this? 
Did this engage them to call upon God? Did this make them in love with prayer? No, it had quite a contrary effect. Verse 14, Therefore say they unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. And in verse 15, What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto him? Second, mercies that are given as returns of prayer do not only make a man consider that they are from God, but draws the heart to God and put a man upon employing them in the service and to the honor of God. Thus we find to be the temper of Hannah. 1 Samuel 1, 27 and 28. Hannah had prayed for a child. God gave her a son. Now what doth she with this mercy? Observe, for this child I prayed, and the Lord hath granted my petition. Therefore have I lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. Seeing God hath heard my prayer and granted my request, therefore will I give this mercy to God to be employed in his service. So First John 3.22, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You see, it is made an evidence that what we receive is received as an answer to our askings because we make those mercies helps to obedience, to keep God's commandments. But now, mercies that come from a common providence do not draw out the heart towards God. They rather draw them out towards sin as it was in the aforementioned Israelites in Psalm 78. Though God did give them their heart's desire, yet were they not estranged from their lust. Third, mercies come from God as returns of prayer where they make you more to rejoice in the God that hears your prayers and gives you the mercy than in the mercy you receive from God. Thus you find it was in Hannah she asked a son and God gave her a son. Yet she saith, 1 Samuel 2, 1, My heart rejoices in the Lord. God gave her a son. She rejoiced in that mercy, but she rejoiced more in the God that gave it. So it was with David in Psalm 85, 6, Thou wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. We will not rejoice chiefly in the mercy, but in thee. But on the contrary, those that receive mercies out of the basket of common providence, they rejoice more in the mercy than in the God of mercy. They rejoice in their wealth and glory and the multitude of their riches. But as for God, they bid him depart from them. They cannot rejoice in God. 